Uh, our MC is Larry Nelson, Jane's husband. I'd just like to say a little bit about the background of our presenters. And don't blame me for the information. I got it from the horse's mouth. Jane Nelson was raised in Gilt Rock. She and her husband Larry moved back up there from a walk from the Milwaukee area in 1995 when they retired. Jane is a former teacher. She has an avid interest in history and is a great promoter of history. She was the original archivist and curator for the Liberty Grove Historical Society Museum. So she's been doing this for a long time. Niles was also raised, Niles Weaver, was also raised in Guild Rock, spending much of his life there. Um, his career was in, ship build, in the shipbuilding industry. He currently lives in Ephraim, where he has served as the fire chief. This story begins with Jane and Niles' great-grandfather, Andrew Weebor, who bought, oh, but wait, let's hear the story directly from the mouths of the Weebor descendants. Please welcome Jane and Niles, and also Larry. Okay. Good afternoon. This is LGH News on the Air. Today we have two prominent people with us who are going to tell us about the history of the Gills Rock Dock, which the town of Liberty Grove has purchased. Welcome Jane Weaver Nelson and Niles Weaver. My first question is, when did this property come into the Weaver hands? Uh, I, I'll take that question. But before I do, I must give a little background of Gills Rock. This little quaint village began with a man named Elias Gill, who came here in the early 1870s. Before that, it was called Hedgehog Harbor. Niles, do you know why it was called Hedgehog Harbor? Well, sure do. Uh, there was a gentleman who built ships on Rock Island, and his name was George Lovejoy in the 1800s. Door County, Rock Island, yes, that's where the first boat was built. And in the fall of the approaching winter, this vessel got thrown to the sea and washed up in Gills Rock, of all places. And when it washed up on the shore, it laid there till spring. Well, they thought it was time to launch the boat. They were going to go there and launch it. But as they found out, it had holes in it. And where did the holes come from? Hedgehogs were chewing up the boat. So there was no use of even thinking of saving that boat. But this is where Hedgehog Harbor came to be. So it has come to be because that's what the hedgehogs that made it. But the name was too long for yeah. to put on a postal stamp that they used to stamp the post each with because it had too many letters. So what did they do? They would step back and Gills, who's founded Gills Rock and part of it, he was the one they said, well, there's a lot of rock around here. Let's call it Gills Rock. <laughs> so that's where Gills Rock was. And it was, uh, how many letters was that? Shorter than Hedgehog? I'm going to tell that later. Oh, you're going to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> I got your prompter right there. Okay. Well, there was another man by the name of Alan Bradley who came later. He was mostly interested in the timber that stood in this area. Anyway, back to Elias Gill. I heard that Elias owned more than 1,000 acres in this area, which to my thinking included the now park property which the town purchased. As you know, there is plenty of rock, as Niles said, in this area, so hence the name Gill's Rock developed. And guess what? It fit on the stamp, on the posting, post office rubber stamp. How did it enter the Weaver hands? Well, a man by the name of Andrew Weaver had come from Norway in about the 1860s. He was born in 1841. So you can use your little brain there to figure out how old he was when he came. He was just a young man and fell in love with a Norwegian gal either here in the U.S. or back in Norway. Her name was Anna Simonson. 
Both these young lovers lived in the Fish Creek area at this time. And as Niles would say, they lived where? Judville. Yeah, our, our family, went, when they came back here to the New World, half of the family went to Judville, half went to the State Park in Peninsula State Park. But in, in this, I don't know if any of you check out these books or have these books, but the one in the park did say that Andrew farmed up there in the park, had farmland. So it's, it's hard to know. Well, anyway, I gotta get back to my teleprompter here. Uh, young Andrew must have made an impression on his father-in-law, Ole Simonson, as he sold him property he owned in Gills Rock. My thinking is that was what is now the town-owned property. Hard to know. I've got the, over on the board, I hope some of you get to, to look at that, there is a deed, a copy of a deed. The deed itself is not in good shape. And so it's a copy of a deed from 1874 from Elias Gill to Ole Simonson, who was Andrew's uh, father-in-law. Since, An since Andrew built his house on the property, and that stood where the Jeff Weber and Benny Weber house stands, still stands there now, and he farmed and fished, and even though we couldn't confirm this, as Larry and I were up to the Sturgeon Bay Courthouse, we do think somehow that this was part of what is now the park property. Anyway, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> Andrew was a busy man. He had six children. And, you know, he was doing lots of things between the sheets. But had three girls and three boys. And, of course, where my grandfather come from was from one of the three boys. And you can look on the chart here where the family tree falls as far as names. But anyway, Arthur married Anna Teske. A lot of you know the Teske relation. That's where the Teskes and the Weaver get related. And of course, if you go far enough out of this peninsula, everybody's related. <laughs> the, old, the old saying goes in Dark County, you talk about nobody's relation because you'll be talking about somebody's relation. So you don't talk about nobody. Anyway, my grandfather passed away in 1952. When the passing took place, uh, blogging was prevalent in Gills Rock. My grandfather had a sawmill on the property and he sawed wood lumber to build houses. And they also had to cut wood for pulp wood for the steam engines who fired the wood and cedar made a very good wood, a hot fire, and made lots of steam. So that was what well, you see in some pictures that you look at piles of cordwood that they harvested off the land to make farmland so they could farm. So another business operating, <laughs> Andrew's ownership of his property was housing for people. And people would come up to Gills Rock and traveling from Chicago, Milwaukee, wherever, and they'd come up on a Friday and get to Gills Rock while there was no boat going at night to Washington Island. So they had to have a place to stay. So my grandfather and great-grandfather built the rooming house for them to stay, and their big house had seven bedrooms in it. So I assume they all were not in the house at one time, so they used those bedrooms also so that the people could stay overnight, and then they might be staying more than one night if it blew. The boats couldn't land coming back from Washington Island, so they had to stay another night and then they go over to Washington Island from there. Anyway, uh, yeah, and in there, also in that house, they had the phone system for getting out in case there was a fire. So, or they needed to get out a call. There was a switchboard. And again, imagine Anna Simonson Weaver was a busy woman. I bet she was. <laughs> Six children, washing sheets, feeding Washington Island visitors, plus the phone service. Wow, she was energetic. 
You know, she maybe was feeding those working at the sawmill, too. Yeah, Andrew also farmed this area. There was a barn on the property located about where the metal building is today uh, on the property that is run by the fishing people, my brother Mark and, and Betty. So anyway, the barn was taken down in about 1930. I also can remember the rocks from the foundation of that barn. We used to use them to sink the pond stakes when they would float. We had a slide of rock down the stake and stand them up and put them in the bottom. So that's how I remember where the barn was. And there's pictures here that shows the barn with a lean-to off of it. Uh, anyway, they did farm the land and the land that was farmed was <coughs> east of Gills Rock. Because right from Gills Rock there's swamp. There is no farmland. So okay. they had to go back further east. So, did uh, did Andrew fish from this area? <laughs> That's a good question. Living that close to the water, I'm sure he did fish by the sheds and the dock down there, which maybe didn't have a dock at that time. I located a newspaper article from 1888 that tells in 1888 Andrew Weaver and Ole Anderson, don't know who that is, went to Menominee, Michigan by ice with a load of fish. In fact, Andrew had two loads. A load or a catch per day was about one ton of trout. He had also purchased much land down in the North Fork area and he had a fishing shack down there. My father, Howard Weaver, remembers as a child staying overnight in this shack. So we don't know if the fish came from Gills Rock or from the Northport area. Well anyways, my dad stayed over with his father and uncles. The story he told me many, many times is that when night came and he was a, a little kid, he'd be in bed and the dishes would rattle. <laughs> he claimed that was from the ghost from people who had died when the schooners went down in the door, or from Indian ghosts. And when we're talking about Indians, it, uh, Andrew's obituary is up there, and it does say in there that he did trading with the Indians. It was told, said that Andrew, when he became older, he still walked from Gills Rock to Northport, and of course, he always had to have his dog along with him, a protection that you needed at that time with the wild animals that were in the area. I imagine he had a dog, yes, I know what the name of the dog, we do not know, but Andrew died when he was 82 years old. And my grandparents, Arthur and Anna Teske, as well as his daughter, Ida Carlson, cared for him in the latter years. His wife, Anna, died at the age of 75. So he was a widower for some years. And they are buried behind the gift shop, what used to be the Lutheran Church in Ellison Bay. And if you go behind the church, you'll see the headstones for Andrew Weaver. <laughs> So how did the dock property end up with the three sons, William, Alfred, and Arthur? Well, for a while now, your grandfather, Arthur, continued to run the farm, while Willie and Alfred fished. Later, Arthur fished with the two brothers. The first boat they had was the A. Weber. We do not have a picture of that, but some of the later boats you'll see up there. Uh, Niles, you know more about the boats and their engines, so I'm going to let you tell this. Well, the A. Weber was built in Gills Rock, would you believe? In the shipyard operated by Onus and Sons, the, the material that was not held up very good. So the next year, the boat had to be replaced with the G.W. Joyce, and they took the engine out of the A. Weaver, and put it into Joyce. In 
1925 or 26, Art decided to go by himself. He fished with his brother-in-law, Frank Teske. That's left the William and Alfred Weaver together. Now they decided to divide up and the property now down there, we do not know when. And we don't know how. <laughs> so how did your father and his brother Emery end up with the fishing rig and property? Well, my grandfather Alfred Weaver had the boat, the Golden Girl, which is up there again. It was a wooden boat. He fished with his brother, William. My grandfather, in 1939, when I was only a year old, passed away, out on the boat. His sons finished lifting the nets and then brought him into shore. Later, my grandmother, Minda Weaver, bought out William's share, and eventually Howard, my dad, and Emery bought the property and rig from their mother. My father fished until he was 90 years old. It was his life. Their shed was built. Now that if you talk about that round shed, that's not the one, it's the next one to it. And their shed was built by Alfred's father-in-law, Art Hoganson. The round roof cement building was built by Glenn and Wallace Weaver. The fish cleaning shed out in the end, uh, we don't know much about when that was, when or how that was built. <clears throat> Niles. Yeah. How <laughs> <laughs> well, about your grandfather's houses, you know, the fire, and et cetera? Yeah, well, as there is what I've been told by my uncle, that in 1935, the original house burned down. And he remembers running up to Jenny Johnson, who lived across the road, who had the only telephone in town to telephone in the fire. Well, you know, the fire station was in Sister Bay, and that's 10 miles from Gills Rock, and uh, by the time we got a crew together and got down to Gills Rock, I think it was a pile of ashes. But my uncle tells me the stove pipe from the stove, which they have a pot belly stove in the middle of the house, and the pipe went out outside, and that pipe fell apart, and that's what started the building of the fire. So that building went down, and they had a summer house, which was where we called me before, what people would stay in when they were going to Washington Island, and there is where they moved into. So that stayed that way until my grandmother passed away. And then about that time was when Jeff came into the picture, because he moved into the old summer kitchen or summer building and added on a couple stall garage. And later, after the building got to be, he needed a better building, he tore off the old building and built the new building that you see today. Okay, now I bet both of you have some special memories of being on that property. I'll tell maybe one or two. You'll get a board. Yes, <laughs> Well, one of the things that I did as a child, more more an older child, like 12, 13, up in those age, was show carrots. Yeah. And that was, they would bring in in the fall. It was always in the fall, November-ish. They'd bring in the nets full of herring, so full that there was no way they could pick them out as they were being brought in the boat. So we kids were hired, and we got paid. Yeah. And we got down, and we had to be called choke herring because you took the herring and squeezed it a little bit, and if it was bloated, you had to take it all and puncture it so that it got small enough to go through the webbing. Now those herring were not for human consumption. They were sold for mink. So the mink, feed, the mink farms around, we did have mink farms around, and they were sold to the mink farms for their food. Uh, then after that, we would have to reel nets, and there's reels up there so you'll see what they look like. And we'd have to, the wet nets, we had to reel up, and then they would be out to dry, and then my mother would come, and, and her uh, cousin was my um, uncle's uh, wife. Yeah, because they were cotton. They, they, they would rot them or get moldy and so on. And so um, 
they would come and uh, real put them back into the box the way that they should be put. And the only other thing I'm going to say is many of you probably don't know that down there, kind of on the other side of what is that? Is that a, a build, build building with the for yeah, it used to be a cooler. Cool, cool, cooler? The little cooler down there. There was a pond, big pond. And my favorite thing was to get polywogs out of the pond, get them home get them to grow their legs, and so on, and then bring them back. And each day when I did this, each day I had to go down for fresh water for them there, because else they would die until they would get their legs, and I'd let them go again back in the pond. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about that pond. Uh, I remember before they were dredging the harbor in 1964, there was low water, like we had several times that you guys can remember. But by did dredging the harbor, where we're gonna go at the fill them real close. So my dad took a fish box cover and put it in by the snapping turtle that was in the pond and he snapped on that cover and my dad with pretty good hands and body just so he could buckle and carry him over and let him go in the water. So when he salvaged the snapping turtle out of the pond. But us kids would catch the frogs and throw them in the tanning tank where they boiled the nets. And then we'd catch some sticks and we'd put them in the, with the frogs and they would swallow the frogs and then we'd take a stick and tap it. And all of a sudden, boop, 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 out they go again. <laughs> you know, we didn't have computers, we didn't have We had to make our own computers. <laughs> anyway, well, I gotta get back so my grandfather, uh, at the time they had two boats, two pond boats. My dad would fish on this side, my grandpa would go to Cedar River, Michigan. Uh, the fishing was better in Cedar River than it was on this side. So it was an hour ride over there and uh, we would set up a net and the boys that were fishing over on Cedar River, they used driven nets. In other words, anchors they didn't have. They drive the, the pegs in the bottom, and that would be their anchor for the nets. Well, it took them two weeks to set up a net. We'd go over there in one day and set up a complete net. Well, consequently, uh, they couldn't stand that, seeing us go home with a boat load of fish, and they were still driving pile again. So what did they do? They went over to our pond and threw the tunnels over the frame pole. Well, when Grandpa got over there and seen that, he said, boom, in the boat, home we come. And he, the boat didn't stop rocking, and he was in his big Roadmaster Buick heading for Cedar River. <laughs> and he told the boys there, Boys, you lifted my nets once, you might be picking lead the next time. <laughs> so anyway, that's the way it went. And then my grandpa took the boys that went along with him over there fishing, took them uptown and they fueled them up. Well, when they come home, they could barely crawl out of the boat. So <laughs> my dad said, Niles, you're going with grandpa to Cedar River. And at that six years old, I was going to Cedar River picking livers when the guys would dress fish on the way home. And I picked livers by the five gallon pail and they were shipped to Chicago for the Ireland Lobster House and they served them as a delicacy on their menu. And they put wax paper in the boxes so that the livers wouldn't go out the sides of the cracks oh. in the box. And that's how they got to Chicago. Okay, there were some other buildings on your that property up. The goose. Oh, the goose coop, yeah. That, uh, when we went from Gills Rock to Bayless Harbor in the winter, Grandpa, we had to catch the chickens, we had to catch the goose, and put them in gunny sacks and haul them to Bayless Harbor, and let them go in the pen up there. Then they would come back in the spring again, and one part of the goose coop, and the chicken coop, was where they put the tar rope, and they piled it up in there so that it would stay dry, because you've got to remember, that wasn't no synthetic rope like we have today. It was all vanilla rope and it would rot. The same thing with the gill nets. If you didn't clean the nets and, and run them through the 
they call a tanning tank because the nets would they put bark in the tanning tank and it turned color like red from the hemlocks and the nets would turn red. They could see the matches easy when they were picking fish. So they're the remedy to their madness. But anyway, uh, that's how that it came to be with the Yeah, well any other? Yeah. I, I think the goose coop was, was very important, but that was the last building that was torn down. So, and... You uh, don't have pictures of that, though, do you? No, I do not have pictures of the goose coop. And another building we had down there was the ice shed. I think that's on one of the pictures. And they used to get the ice, of course, in the winter, and then they would cover it with sawdust to use. And uh, they used that kind of ice until they got the ice machines. And we kids loved to play in the ice uh, shed because it would be so cool. And so it was up over the big bricks we would climb, and a lot of memories, a lot of memories. But the, Are there any? Oh. But that ice, putting up ice was a major thing <coughs> because uh, as, as fishing got to be better, they had to have bigger facilities. So then my grandpa and dad put up a new ice house up by the house, and the old one stayed for Howard and Emory and Wallace and Glenn. But at 10 years old, I was driving a Model A. And my dad took a, I'll mind you, you, you ones that collect antiques. This was a 24 Model A with a rumble seat in the back. And it had a ivory steering wheel and an ivory shifting lever and spoke wheels. So what did my dad do? He took a chisel and chiseled down from the rumble seat on the back and folded it down and shoved planks in there. That's how I hauled ice from the ice house down. And Grandpa would say, how many cakes do we got to have today, Grandpa? We'd go up there and get the cakes out, shovel them out, cover up the ice again, bring them down, wash the sawdust off of them. And then we didn't have an ice machine, but we had a drum that had pegs on it that was electrically powered by a motor. And it chiseled the ice up so they could use it on the box to fit. You must have been above ours then, because my dad had one of these with a ch oh, chisel, like, yeah, oh, chisel yeah. like that. That was, a that was higher class. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, are there any questions that anybody has? Yogi, you tell, you Yogi. Did you tell Yogi. a story about the dog? I, I don't know much about that. That was Wallace's dog. But he would go out, see, they have Gilnet. And another thing over there, I have put some of the hooks because many of you didn't know that one of the early type of fishing was hook fishing before there were they used the nets and so on and so there, there I have a picture there of the type of boats that went out to get the herring to bait the hooks for fishing for trout and uh, where was I yeah, uh, the black dog. okay the black dog and uh, uh, when so they now had pond fishing as well as gillnet fishing mm -hmm. and pond fishing the dog would always be along in fact in the 1968 or 9 or 7 or something like that National Geographic I think the dog is in the picture along with my father in the center pole of the you National Geographic the carcass hole. when they finished cleaning that fish they toss the remains they had in the Body up in the air, and that dog just wandered. Okay, okay. You maybe know more about the dog. No, I, I was just, as a kid. I was, but, but I don't know. Like yeah, it was, it was Yogi, and I, I really don't know. He had one before Yogi, and that was Cinder. Okay. She was a black cocker spaniel, and that was before Yogi. Did that one go out on the boat too? Like? Yeah. That. Oh well, yeah. Wherever Wallace went, the dog had it. <laughs> Wallace was the one with dog. We had a dog too, but he didn't go out on the boat. Wallace was the one that smoked most of the smoke fish. Smoke fish, right. <coughs> right. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I have one for Miles. Okay. You talked about that Model A with the rumble seat, and you said you were 10. But when you were a teenager, you would have made a great double date. <laughs> <laughs> with the Model A, that if, when you were a teenager, that would have made a, that seat would have made a great double date. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's one of the rumble sequence. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. When I was a kid, we called you guys wee birds. Yes. And now you claim you're wee boards. No, I don't know. That, that was Mark that changed that. <laughs> but it really was spelled double V 
A-N-N-I-B-O-R-G. And the spelling got changed because in Norway, when you say the ABCs, you come to the letter I, you don't say I like we do, you say E. So that's why coming from Norway, the I had that pronunciation. So who did it, we don't know, but all of a sudden they said, well, it's going to sound like an E. You might as well put an E in there. So and that's why it's spelled W-E. Place, some places they just left the V, they dropped the I and E. Yeah. And, and our ancestors came normally from a town in Denmark, Viborg. So that's where, and then they moved to Norway, and then from Norway over, over to here. We kind of we kind of think it could have changed at Port of Entry in New York. Yeah, it's hard to know. And you don't know where. Like yeah. these are the W's, the I's, and the E's. They put them up. So. Uh, I can add to that. Uh, uh, B E R G uh, in in German means mountain. Uh, in all Scandinavian languages, they're Germanic base. Uh, but in this case. A U uh, would be a village, B U R G. And I think in Scandinavia, B O R G meant village or city, and this above by Borg Denmark. So the last name was Borg rather than Berg, and Berg would connote the mountain. But, but there are names with Berg, and, uh, but most of those uh, Germanic based names have a meaning uh, rather than a lot of names still don't have a particular uh, meaning associated with them. A lot of German or Germanic based language names have a, a meaning uh, to them. Uh, as far as the pronunciation, it depends on what end of the family you're on. <laughs> that end says we work, this end says we work. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just call them Jane and yep. Niles? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it came to a clear, but up until the late 40s, early 50s, uh, they would harvest heavy ice out of the bay and put it in ice houses with sawdust, uh, and then you would crush the blocks of ice as you need them throughout the fishing season. And the sawmill folks would come down from Sister Bay, and they would cut blocks of ice, and they had an elevator that would go down to pull the blocks of ice out, and then the trucks would then haul them to the ice houses. Um, so that's how ice machines came in uh, in the early 50s. Uh, we stopped harvesting ice out of the bay. <laughs> well, did, did the ice last all season? Did they ever run out, or was they always? Uh, they they did typically had enough. You know, they would put up a, enough so that uh, they probably had more than for that season. Uh, and uh, so that's one of my earliest things: is breaking up the sawdust because it was frozen in the winter. Uh, and I ran a pick to the side of my boot. <laughs> <laughs> and they also, if they could get ice, that formed like ice banks along the shore, they go and get that ice so they didn't use up the ice they had in the ice house. So yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, if you're up here in the spring of the year when the heavy bay ice starts moving, uh, and if, if the bay ice moves out uh, with the wind and then comes back towards the shore, it doesn't stop. It starts piling up uh, well, in the shore areas where it first hit. Sometimes it wipes out docks or it goes into the woods. And there was a shove that our folks would tell us about on the end of Door Bluff that was 125 feet high. We climbed uh, that. We climbed that. Yeah. 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 We were standing in Gill's Rock, about side by the shed in the spring of the year. We heard that. Oh, we were looking for the bombers to come over. <laughs> <laughs> and here it was the ice shoving it over Zion Camp Dock on the other side, and it went way up into the trees at Zion Camp. Well, one year up in the, the Peninsula State Park, it went way up over the bluffs. Yeah. Wow. I actually have a picture of myself on that ice show. Do you? Up by Zion Camp. Yeah. yeah. And in shorts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was real sharp. <laughs> okay. It, yeah, we have a picture, I know, someplace here. Any other questions? What age was your dad when he started fishing? Um, he only went, he went to the Elson Bay School, the, the log place here when it was down in, in um, on the hill. And he went there until uh, through his sophomore year. And I'm sure he fished summers before that. And I'm sure that's when it started. He was in there full time. Just as a school teacher, I think of your father being so successful 
only going through sophomore year. Our dad, yeah. Marvin, was only through eighth grade. Eighth grade. My mom was only eighth grade. Eighth grade. Eighth grade. I mean, the, 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 the futures that we have now is because they started when they were in their early ages and, and had no schooling, but no. they made it. Well, right can there. you imagine running from Gills Rock all the way to Gibraltar? And that, <laughs> you know, that would take two, three days to get that far. So that's why when they got through the eighth grade schools, but that was the end of it. But didn't your mom? Um, she went to Sturgeon Bay. Right, but Brussels, she boarded out. Brussels she, first and then back yeah, to Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. But if you go to Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Uncle Tom's oh, Cabin, Uncle <laughs> Tom's Candy, that's where the old Newport Schoolhouse was. Yes. And I was the last graduating class out of Newport. They shut her down after I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what's the difference between Newport and Ellison Bay? They said, Newport, the plaster has fell, and Ellison Bay has just started. Now today, Ellison Bay is gone, and Newport's still there. <laughs> yeah, if you've been to that school, going toward your bay, uh, one of our relatives now runs, runs at a beast of ours, the Niles and Lenny. Uh, and when I started first grade, he was in the big room, I was in the little room. <laughs> and and uh, in first grade, there was a, a girl and myself, so I was 50% of the first grade class. <laughs> well, there were only two of us. My cousin, Noel, Emery's daughter, oh, and myself. There was two of you, too. Yeah. We have, well, we had three. We had Jackie Halston. Okay. But he decided, his family decided to get out of here, and so mm -hmm. they moved. So it was the two of We had a big class. We had eight in our class.